trying to run Cassandra on Raspberry Pis. Um, I'm also going to talk about some of the problems we get from this. Um, and there's a few. Let people sit down. Basically, the idea was, you know, Cassandra is hardware ag agnostic. It's a, basically a Java program. It should run on anything that will run Java, shouldn't it? So we had the idea, why not try and run it on these Raspberry Pis? Um, how hard can it be? It can't be that difficult, surely. And once we do, uh, what are we going to do with it once we, once we get it to working? So I guess I shall explain who I am. And that might explain slightly more why we have the idea of doing this. So I'm Andy Cobley. Uh, I got the grand title that I gave myself of the program director of the MSCs in data science and business intelligence at the University of Dundee. Um, got my Twitter account there, just in case you want to follow me. Okay, so I guess the first question is how many of you guys have got a Raspberry Pi? And there's a couple of you. Yeah. So what's really interesting is that um, when I first started giving this talk, uh, there'd be like two hands going up. And by the end of the month, it was like half the audience. And it slowly, 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 it didn't even slowly, it just completely took off the number of people with these things. So for those of you who don't know, basically a uh, Raspberry Pi is a single chip um, Linux computer running a Broadcom chip. Um, 500 meg of RAM in the new ones, 256 meg on the old ones. Uh, boots off an SD card, which makes it uh, particularly good if you, um, if you want to make images. It's just like basically creating a virtual machine image. You can just create a whole bunch of SD cards and want the image you want and just boot it very, very quickly. It's got an Ethernet port, uh, which makes it useful. And basically everything you're going to need to run a general purpose computer. Um, got a wee picture here of one of these things next to a pound coin. So that's the pound coin there. And you can see basically how big it is. And I've got one of them here. So I guess we can throw them around. Put my power supply gone. There you go. That's probably the first time you've seen someone throw a Cassandra machine at someone in a, in a room. <laughs> And you can throw it around between each other. Virtually impossible to break. <laughs> you could snap it in half. Okay. Sorry? Oh, yeah, if you really wanted to break it that way. So, so there's people passing one of them around. Um, and just so you can see it, that is actually a Raspberry Pi Cassandra cluster <laughs> running Cassandra as we speak. See? So that's probably the first time you've seen anyone lift a Cassandra cluster up with one hand as well. Oops, one of the nodes has now gone down. Okay, I'm glad I could do that because when I tried to do that in the States, we couldn't because foolishly I took everything but the Ethernet switch I took uh, was a UK one, because they run at 110 volts and their really weak electricity wouldn't run an Ethernet switch. <laughs> okay, so here's some of the, some of the challenges. Um, the Cassandra is obviously designed to be quite fast at writing, very fast at writing. Um, it's now very fast at reading. I mean, uh, any of you guys who've used Cassandra for some time, Back to something like 0 0.8, it used to be considerably slower at reading and writing, but they've done some great work in making that faster. My little laptop here, if I'm running a single node, Cassandra cluster will run about 12,000 write operations a second, which is not bad. One Raspberry Pi by itself will do 200 operations a second. That's a bit of a disadvantage. So the first take home message that you guys, you know, this isn't a production cluster, it's not even a proper test cluster, but it is a challenge. Okay, so even more bad news, uh, you can try it if you want to, but if you put an external USB drive on there, 
a proper full USB drive, even a nice fast SSD, you're going to find it runs even slower than just it running it off one of these disks. And if I can, I'm going to try and pull you up a schematic. I don't know if I can. Uh, I've lost it, so we'll not do it. OK, so the reason why it doesn't run any faster is that the USB uh, port is essentially running on exactly the same chip, chip as the network port, so you get uh, contention between the two. If you look at the schematic, I could show you that, but we can't. So we can't make it any faster by putting any nice fast disks on it. Um, so that's one problem. Next problem is Java. We need to run a Java uh, machine to be able to run Cassandra. So um, we did some tests. I did some tests some time ago on Oracle Java versus OpenJDK. Who thinks the blue line is Oracle Java? No, that's OpenJDK, of course. OpenJDK is considerably slower than Oracle. Um, probably in, real li in, in general life, even on real machines, but certainly on, on a Raspberry Pi. And that's important because um, Oracle don't support, uh, or the official Oracle Java doesn't support the hardware floating point thing where the open JDK does. So, the official distribution of the operating system is Raspbian, which is basically Debian for the Pi, and it uses the hard floating point accelerator, which will make your Debian a bit faster. I say much faster there, but actually let's be realistic, it's a bit faster. We're not talking about fast machines. And the current official Oracle JDK won't run on Debian at all. So that's why people had to use OpenJDK. That's the official one. Fortunately, um, Oracle have released a beta version of um, Oracle 8, uh, Java 8. Um, so Java might prefer 6. The old versions of uh, uh, Cassandra prefers Java version 6. Uh, Cassandra 2 prefers Java version, in fact, it will only run with Java version 7. Fortunately, you can get a JDK 8 in preview from Oracle. It should make things a bit faster. Sadly, it doesn't. It's not entirely clear why, but um, if you do run JDK 8 uh, on Debian, you don't get much of a performance boost at all using the hardware. Float, uh, floating point uh, accelerator. Uh, you guys are all Cassandra experts. You'll know that you've got uh, in, in 1.0, Cassandra started using compression for compress the tables, uh, which gives you two to, two to four times reduction in the data size, 25 to 35 uh, percent performance on reads and 5 to 10 performance on writes. This is one of the reasons why reads now um, run almost as fast as writes in the compression. Now, this gives us trouble too. Until recently, um, Cassandra used two types uh, the Google, Google snappy, snappy compressor which is faster reads and writes, and the deflate compressor. These are configurable in the Cassandra YAML file, uh, which is basically a Java zip. It's slower, but gives a better compression. Problem is, snappy compression isn't available on the Pi. Um, it requires native methods to get it to run. And actually, uh, there, is a, there was a Java um, JIRA bug report filed because uh, Compression was turned on by uh, default in some places, and it completely stopped. There was at least one Java version that just wouldn't run on a Raspberry Pi because it just went bang when it tried to load up the snappy compressor. Um, and the snappy compressor, in fact, wasn't uh, producing the right uh, exception. It was just producing an error, a standard error message and wasn't feeding the, com the exception back up to um, Cassandra. Fortunately, Cassandra 1.2 has started using um, LZ4 compression, which just works 
fine on this on the uh, on um, the Raspberry Pi, no problem at all. Any you, any of you who've actually looked into the startup script, you might find this curious line that says uh, some processors, such as Raspberry Pi, don't report the number of uh, processors they have. And this is true. The startup script um, for Cassandra will allocate memory according to how many processors it has. The Raspberry Pi always reports that it's got zero processors. So if you do whatever amount of memory you've got and divide it by zero, that's going to be a big bad bang. Fortunately, the startup script now fixes it. It says if it's, if it's zero processors, let's at least assume there's one. Now, this is one of the advantages of at least trying to do it on, on a machine like this. Um, we don't know where Cassandra is going to be t uh, turning up in the future. At least now, someone in production, for whatever, whatever job they're trying to do, isn't going to run into this problem. If you're going to run uh, these in a cluster, you have to at least in Cassandra Env uh, set up the, the JMX configuration properly, um, else no tool ain't wo won't work and your cluster won't talk to each other. Um, in real most um, uh, um, clusters that you're running in production, you don't need to do this, but Raspberry Pi, you do have to do it. There's also a problem with JVM ops. Um, in 1.2, they added use cond card mark uh, for better locking on hotspots with multi core processors. Um, sadly, the uh, JDK 1.8 that's available at the moment doesn't have support for this option. Uh, when it tries to, so, when it tries to start up, it's going to go bang again. So, you just need to go into cassandraenv.shell and um, comment that out. So at this point you might be thinking, why bother with this at all? Why not just give up on the whole idea? Stand in the corner and cry. Well, there's one thing we've forgotten. Raspberry Pi's cost about 25 quid. You need an SD card for next to nothing. Um, as you've seen here, you might be wondering how I'm powering these these uh, Raspberry Pis, basically I've got a USB port here. Uh, it's not actually doing any USB stuff, it's just acting as a four port power supply. So that's nice and cheap. And these are standard um, Samsung phone charging cables at about £1.25 each. So there's a, uh, a, a data center power supply for 20 quid or thereabouts. Um, what you can't do is you can't run more than four off one of these USB hubs. Uh, or you can, but you'll soon find out it's not a good idea. What happens is, as you, if you put five on there, and then you start running um, a, um, a stress test, as, they start to run, as the PIs start to get more and more power that they're using, they actually drag down the, the voltage supply on this until they start resetting start resetting themselves. So four is about the maximum you can do, but still it's quite good. So 25 quid, what can we do with it? There you go. There's a 64 node supercomputer produced by Southampton University for less than 2,000 pounds. And again, they're, to, they're using their uh, students, they're giving that to their students to play with. It's not running Cassandra, that but it doesn't matter. It's nice. Somebody's produced a 32-node Beowulf compute computer. That's uh, Joseph Keepert at Boys University. He's done a particularly nice job, I think, of flashing lights. And it's not just universities as well. I came across this recently. This is LinkedIn. They created a, I think it's a 10-node Hadoop cluster running Raspberry Pi. And the nice thing I like about this is that the they put little LEDs on there. So the nodes that are doing the map job flash red, and the ones that are doing the reduced jobs flash blue. So you can see the process of the Hadoop job across the processors. As we all know, adding nodes isn't, is good. 
um, adds performance, it adds uh, copies of the data. Make sure, though, that your ring is balanced. If you're trying this on a Raspberry Pi, they really don't like being unbalanced. They start going into nasty um, garbage collection and compaction um, fits, and one of them will just die. So make sure you've got it all balanced. V-nodes would be very nice um, to run on these. Sadly, I've not managed to get 1.2 running properly. We'll talk about Cassandra 2 a bit later on because there's issues there as well. So what sort of performance do we get? Um, that's the performance for a 3-4 node cluster. It's not particularly stellar. Um, the blue line's three nodes, the sort of green line's four nodes, getting up to about 700 operations per second. And you can see at the end of both of those runs, you can see where it com starts compacting <coughs> the tables. The bottom two lines are the right performance. I think this is a slightly older version of Cassandra, probably um, 0.9 or something like that, because we did it a while ago. And just for comparison, you can see what three, four, five, and six nodes. And you can just basically see, and you can confirm that the more nodes that you add, the faster that this cluster is getting. Just for completeness, this is the stress test uh, com commands I was using. This was, uh, as I say, this is, I think, with version 1 or 1.1 1 .1 that didn't like snappy, um, snappy compressors, so we had to uh, put in deflate compressor to make sure that it would actually, it would actually run on the, on the uh, stress test command. If you want to get more memory for Cassandra to run, you can actually grab some of the memory from the graphics chip. Uh, essentially, you just change to the boot command, boot directory, and you copy out the start.l file and replace it with arm224 start.elf if you want to do this manually. If you don't want to do it manually, what you can do is you can boot up a fresh copy of Raspbian, plug it in with a, into a monitor, and it gives you a nice GUI that you can actually set all these options yourself. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you can run that manually. Yeah. Some of these slides are really just for people who want to follow this through and do it themselves. So. Um, I prefer static network addresses on these uh, just because it makes it easier uh, when you're doing it on a kitchen table to know exactly which one you're writing to. So you know, if you actually look at these, you'll see that I've actually written 10 on there. So that is actually 196168.0.10. So I actually know each which, which one. If anyone, any of them fail, I can pull out the plug directly. <laughs> no, I haven't tried it with Wi-Fi. <laughs> I'm frightened of that. <laughs> um, if you want to, these things are written onto an SD card. Uh, it's a fairly simple Unix command to copy them. And so the nice thing you can do is it means you can just um, make one copy, then copy it multiple times and just plug it in. Uh, if you're doing it in the sort of environment I think we're probably doing it with undergraduates. It means that you can have a set of cards with different versions of Cassandra set up so people can compare different performance and different um, configurations. Um, you could do it with virtual, with virtual machines, but this is nicer. If you want to start it as a service, uh, there's a few um, differences to starting it up on standard Debian. So I took the... Uh, an example startup file, hacked it around a bit, and you can find it out on GitHub there um, and use that instead so you can start Cassandra as a service on this thing. So why am I doing this really? Really I'm doing it so that we can do it for teaching undergraduates. For 200 quid we can get an eight node Cassandra cluster for kids to play with. Uh, reconfigured, blown away, stress tested, generally abused, doesn't matter. Uh, if a student runs off with one of these, we've lost £25 worth of computer as opposed to however much a real computer is. 
We can simulate data racks, data centers, long net worth delays. Um, under, or some of our undergraduate students are using these for playing with configurations at the moment because uh, we've just started a uh, big data undergraduate course, undergraduate module. And because Cassandra is a course network aware with data centers, we can play with st um, storing data across simulated center, uh, data centers. So the sort of thing that we're looking at doing, and I'm hoping to get undergraduates to play with this, is basically taking two switches. I've lost, lost some of my diagram there for some reason. So if you imagine on switch one, you've got a data center of uh, Raspberry Pis, and on switch two, you've got another data center of Raspberry Pis. You use a nice 10 megabits hub as opposed to a, a switch, an old-fashioned repeater, essentially. Inject some noise into there so you can slow down the track between switch one and switch two, and that will simulate dirty lines, bad, um, bad delays, and all sorts of other things for students to play with. Somebody, when I was giving this talk in California, said, why not use TC, the Linux command TC, to shape the uh, bandwidth on? And if you think about it, net, these things have got one network port. Um, so if you run TC on them, all you're going to do is uh, delay the, the network traffic between each Cassandra node. And what you actually want to do is do the delay between those two switches. So one thing you could do, I guess, is if you can get yourself a, a Linux box with two network ports and replace that hub with a TC thing. I guess you could. Yeah, yeah. I always like giving this because I learn little things like this. Sorry, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyway. On there anyway, so that's the start. You may not even need to put noise injection in because it will. Yeah, might be enough just to slow it down anyway. <laughs> yeah, the fact that it's even trying to do it. Yeah. So obviously, there's some recommendations uh, for running Cassandra on uh, machines in general, and one of the recommendations is to bind the Thrift uh, interface to one card and the RPC interface to a different card. I've seen out there. Can't do that. So what about Cassandra 2? Um, I guess you guys know that in Cassandra 2 there's inter-node compression as well as compression on the disk. So uh, the, the, the data traffic between nodes is actually compressed using the snappy compressor. Um, again, if you try doing that on these things, it's going to go bang. Um, so you need to go into the, con the YAML config file and turn into node compression off. Um, I believe coming in um, the next version of Cass in Cassandra, I think in 2.02 or perhaps a bit later, they're going to give you the option to use the L4Z compressor instead of snappy compressor. So that'll give you better compression ratio anyway. And that kind of came because we found that this wasn't going to work on these raised a Jira issue. So how does Cassandra 2 run on Pi? Well, the bad news is badly for some reason. Um, what I've seen happening, and I've still not got to the bottom of it, I'll tell you now, is that as you run the stress test, the stress test is going to run for about five minutes, and then one node is going to go into terminal garbage collection compaction and it's always a random node as well. It's really weird. Uh, can't work out what's causing it. So one thing you can do is that this, this John Berryman that some of you may uh, follow on Twitter um, created this wonderful blog because he, he had a customer that said, can we run uh, Cassandra in 64 megabytes of memory for our developers so I can run a whole bunch of virtual machines and each one has got their own virtual one? So there's a blog there on how to tune Cassandra down to very low amounts of memory. And if you do that with Cassandra 2 on these pies, it will actually run. It just runs a bit slower than it would have done. But there's some really useful advice there. 
Okay, I'm going to see if we can see it running. So there's four Cassandra nodes running. Um, this is difficult because I can't see what I'm doing. Okay, let's try, if I press return here, you should see the Cassandra stress test running. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so 69 operations per second to begin with. It's immensely fast. <laughs> that will ramp up after a certain amount of time. And then you'll see, obviously, uh, some of the messages by tracing the log file up there. We're up to 104. Uh, class 10. So it's about the fast that will, fastest that will run on these. Yeah. Uh, but yes, that, that's the other thing that will also cause it. We had a question, what class of SD card are you using? Um, if you use a lower class, a slower, and you'll get lots and less speed. So class 10 is about the fastest you can use. We're up to 257 <laughs> operations per second. Um, at some point, that will start dying badly. <laughs> Okay, so <coughs> takeaway message here. Cassandra wouldn't run on a Pi to begin with. It does now. It was only minor changes that needed to be done, but they've shook out basically some minor bugs that will bite someone at a later time, perhaps. Um, some, of the, some of my BI students, uh, data science students, at least one of them, works in a very secure lab. Uh, and to be able to get a new piece of software or a new machine in that lab, it has to go through six months of uh, acceptance testing. So he basically just, uh, he plays around with pies in the canteen where he's allowed to, and he can test software, and then he'll go and put in the request for it to be run through the lab, run through the testing regime. It's a nice way of getting round officialdom, for instance. Mostly, though, Pi is for fun. I mean, I did this because it was, I started out doing this because it was just pure geeky fun. Let's see if I can ever get this working. But someone was saying to me last night in the pub, um, you think about it, some kid in his bedroom, he can now run, essentially, and play with a four-node cluster in front of him, and he can see what happens when you do that to the cluster and turn it off and then turn it back on again. Actually, it'll be fine. It doesn't, doesn't bother it. I wouldn't do that with a real Cassandra cluster, by the way. Just pull the power supply. <laughs> but that works. I have to do the obligatory plug. Uh, the university pays me to come, so I have to mention that we do actually have a data science MSc where we deal with big data and we do some Cassandra training, amongst other things. This is one of our students smiling in front of us. <laughs> and you can ask him how, what it's like, but I have, to, I have to do that, otherwise I get in trouble. So what we've talked today, basically, is can we get Cassandra running on Raspberry Pi? It's cheap. It does run. You make clusters cheaply for experimentation. Generally, it's a lot of fun. It's very frustrating at times, um, but it's good fun. So, thank you. And any questions? You were saying about the game of games uh, not being as efficient as it would be on hard float? Yeah, on, on hard float, yeah. Not, not yet. The, the, the new beta versions are coming out. Um, I mean, it could be that they've just released one and I didn't know yet. Okay, has that just been released? Oh, that's 7? 7.45. Right, that must have just been released recently, has it? There you go. I'm out of date before it. <laughs> that's good news. Sorry? No, I've not tried that, no. no. You don't... <laughs> yeah, it'd be another interesting thing to have a go. Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 you're right, even the BIOS is there, yeah. Yeah. Now, you, you, you know, you can, you know, that's, that's, you know, if you're sensible, that's the thing you'd probably do. Yeah, if I was playing like it was, it was just um, the 
they then have a virtual switch mm -hmm. for the local LAN, um, the VMs you have running. So if you have four VMs running on the same machine, you can all talk using the same prod. That's, <coughs> I mean, again, that's, that's, that's handy, but there's, you know, <coughs> Many ways, there's nothing like seeing the flashing lights and the wires. <laughs> so you, you, you could always do that on VMware, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll reboot them now, and they'll probably come back, back up in about two minutes. <laughs> no problem. Sorry? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yes, yeah, yeah. You can blow them up if you put too much voltage on them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like the LinkedIn one on Hadoop, which showed different colored lights according to what they're doing. So, I mean, you've got the source code for Raspberry Pi. You could go in there and hack it and start. I mean, I've I've thought about having a Cassandra-driven robot or something, so you then SQL commands to Cassandra and it, then <laughs> and it draws across the room. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, we're going very off topic because this isn't Cassandra, but so you... you any of you guys who know um, Arduino um, hardware, you could, there's, a, there's, a, there's a converter you can plug into the top and that allows you to plug Arduino boards directly into it. Um, but it won't drive motors uh, directly. So um, I think I've got up somewhere on GitHub or somewhere, there's a, there's a, I've, I've written a, um, a, a pulse width modulation controller for this that allows you to drive motors directly through the Arduino board. But, but we're very off topic here, <laughs> into hardware lessons. Okay, I think I'll call that a day, and I think that's about half an hour, so thank you very much for coming, and I hope you've learned something. <laughs>